that's the sound of another sale on your online Shopify store. But did you know that Shopify powers in-person selling too? From events to farmer's markets to shows, Shopify is the sound of selling everywhere. I've definitely been selling at an event and struggled between reconciling payment processors, inventory before and after the event, and easy reporting. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. Prep for your next event with hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's point-of-sale Go Mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash startup CPG, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash startup CPG to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash startup CPG. This isn't an ad, but I'm borrowing an ad spot to tell you about how this month, July 2023, you, yes, you, dear listener, have a chance to win one of six incredible prize boxes filled with some of my favorite emerging brands products that have been featured on the show. All you have to do to enter the giveaway is leave a five-star review for the Startup CPG podcast and submit proof in a really short form. That's it. I'm literally personally packing up these boxes filled with delicious soups from Subi, the best banana bread mix from Godana's, functional mushroom granola from Forage, dried pineapple with moringa and hibiscus from Amazi, upcycled raspberry jam from Chia Smash, the most flavorful tortillas I've had from Eureka Tortilla, and Nowhere Bakery's celebrity-worthy cookie mix. It's seriously taking all my willpower to send you these prize boxes instead of keeping them for myself. If you've learned something from this show and would like to give back to us, please check out the link in the show notes with instructions on how to leave your review and enter the contest. Reviews are incredibly important for helping new people discover the show. If you have an iPhone, which over 80% of you do, I see you. It's best to leave the review in the Apple Podcasts app, which is most important for rankings. But if you have an Android, a Spotify review is also great. I already appreciate you so much for listening, but nothing keeps us all going here like a five-star review. So hit pause now or when you're able to safely use a phone and head to the show notes to get entered into the giveaway and then come right back. I'll have a Jake Carl's dance party while I wait for you. You back? Okay, cool. Nice to see you again, and thanks for supporting the show. It really is about building those relationships because if you're working with a large operator, they probably won't want to work with you if you have zero distribution. If they say, hey, I prefer Vistar, hey, I prefer Cisco, they're not just going to want to stock that product in all of their locations if nobody can order it. Welcome to the Startup CPG Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Freitag. I'm so excited to bring back a very popular guest from last year, Jenna Cameron, for another food service episode. We released episode number 74 with Jenna during December of last year as part of the First Hire series, and our conversation focused on first hires for food service sales. Our community seems hungry for food service knowledge, and so we asked Jenna to come back on the show to walk us through the biggest players in food service, from distributors to operators to buying groups and more. Jenna is currently the sales lead at Simulate and has over 10 years of experience in plant-based food service sales for emerging brands. Listen in as Jenna shares about key term definitions to frame the conversation, including operators versus buying groups versus redistributors, major distributors to know in food service, including details on DOT, Cisco, US Foods, and more, plus other regional distributors and how to work with each, some of Jenna's favorite operators from campus stores to Disney to Red Robin and others and specific nuances, an overview of key buying groups like Compass and Aramark and how to get started with a buying group, C-Store or convenience store channel ideas, resources for finding a regional broker for food service or an advisor, and right at the end, we cover Grocerant, which are the restaurants within grocery stores, and Grocerant is incidentally my new favorite word, and more. Please note that Jenna drops a lot of detailed information in this episode, and if you're worried about catching all the company names that she's dropping, fret not. I have included all the distributors, buying groups, and operators that she mentions in the show notes with links just for you. Now let's hear from Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Welcome back to the show. So good to have you back here. How are you doing today? 
Hey, Jesse, I'm good. I just got back from my honeymoon and catching up on work and stuff like that. And it's been a crazy May and June, like absolutely crazy, but good. Awesome. I'm so glad that we could have you here. Your episode that we did last year about food service and first hires was really popular and people loved it. And so it's great to have you back by popular demand to talk more about food service and kind of some of the big players in this space. And so before we dive into that, for those that may not have listened to our other episode with you, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your current role? And also last time we talked, you had just started your role. So we'd love to hear how it's going at Simulate and what you do there to kick us off. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Jenna Cameron, and I have been in the plant-based food space for the past 10 years, currently with Simulate. So Simulate makes delicious, indistinguishable plant-based chicken. Our current products, we do breaded and unbreaded. So we have nuggets, tenders, we have crispy cutlets, we have unbreaded pieces, and we do uh, food service and retail. We actually started in 2019 as a direct-to-consumer brand and developed this awesome cult following of about 150,000 D2C customers and then launched into retail in 2020 slash 2021 and then food service right after that. So I have been with Simulate for or... I don't know, like eight months or something. And they brought me in to build out the food service channel. Just like our last episode, first food service hire, super relevant to what I do. So right now I'm just like working in on building out distributors, operator partnerships, launching new products, stuff like that. In my previous startups, like I said, I've been in the space for 10 years. I was with Just, the plant-based egg company for six of those years and joined extremely early on. They had maybe 20 employees when I joined. And then by the time that I left, we had 200 plus employees of wow. brand new headquarters, much bigger company. And then after just, I briefly worked for a plant-based dog food company called Wild Earth. Brian Bethencourt is the CEO. It's a Shark Tank company. Mark Cuban's one of the investors. And then after that, I was with Alpha. And Alpha makes like amazing breakfast sandwiches, burritos, all kinds of plant-based products. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. Are you able to share some of the projects and channels that you're working on at Simulate right now? Like which areas that you're focusing on? Absolutely. Without giving away too much detail, at Simulate, we are working on launching a very exciting new product sometime later this year, early next year. If you go over to our Instagram, you can see a couple of early photos of it. So that is what I will say. It's not on the market yet. So on the product development side, we have a lot of fun things happening. And then more generally, because Simulate is newer in food service, the things I'm working on right now are just building the building blocks of, of food service. So we're stocked in DOT, which is super helpful. I just attended the DOT show. We had some great leads and conversations following that. And DOT is, they're basically a big food service distributor, they're a redistributor. And about 70% of their business is actually selling to distributors like Cisco, wow. US Foods, Buy Right here in California. Pretty much everybody uses DOT. So it's a really good opportunity to get in front of new distributors. And then they also have a national account, national accounts team. So in addition to working with distributors, they also work with big national accounts and have good relationships there. So yeah, so one of the things I just wrapped up, I got married, I did the DOT show, and then I went on my honeymoon. But it it was a really important show for us to be at. And then looking forward in about two weeks, we are attending the NACUF show. And NACUF is an operator specific show. And it stands for the National Association of Colleges and Universities in Food Service. So we're going to be um, talking to a lot of CNUs in about two weeks. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. And the kind of information you just provided on DOT is exactly why we're here today. So I love that and excited to, to hear more from you about the other players in the space as well. Can you also define some kind of 101 terms for us as well. Operator, distributor, buying groups. Can you describe some of those terms and any other terms you can think of that you're going to be using throughout our conversation? And we can clarify as we go to, but I wanted to give you a chance to set up some of the terms for those folks that might not be familiar. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I feel like this comes up a lot in conversation, whether that's internal and I'm sharing with a Simulate team member, hey, what is food service? Or if I'm talking to someone else who works in the startup space and they're trying to unpack food service, it can be a little confusing. And there's a lot of like terminology and lingo, but essentially the way that I look at food service is it's anywhere that you eat when you're outside of the home. So that could be like a hospital or where you go to school, a college university, it could be a restaurant like Burger King or Panda Express. So it's basically anywhere you eat outside of the home. And within that bucket, there's a lot going on behind the scenes to support food service. There are operators, there are distributors, and then there are buying groups. So operators just means any end customer. So anything that you go and you like see it, right? Like you can like order on DoorDash or you go and you like sit down and you eat out. So this is you're interacting with 
the operator. It can be a college university, a restaurant chain, a theme park. It could be like a corporate cafeteria at LinkedIn or Twitter. And then distributors are the people who are servicing all of that business. So a distributor would be like Cisco or US Foods or Buy Right here in California. They're the folks who are actually like ordering all of those products from manufacturers like Simulate in order to supply the restaurant or the CNU with that item. And then there are buying groups. So buying groups are also a really crucial part of food service because they help operators get the products that they want and they can even um, do a lot of that work in staffing for them. So a buying group would be Compass Food Buy, um, Sodexo, Aramark. So they basically take care of all of those purchasing decisions and those ingredients in order to supply the operator with all of the menu items that they want and need. Interesting. Okay, great. That's super helpful. And where do you where would you like to dig in first in the spaces buying groups or distributors? What do you think makes the most sense? Just because I am like fresh off the dot show, let's start with distributors. Yeah. In general, when you're building out food service strategy, it's really important to develop that push and pull strategy. So that's why it's equally important to focus on distributors and operators. So you're essentially, you need to sell into an operator so there's a demand. And so when you have a product stocked at a distributor, people are actually buying it. Because if you don't do that, it's just going to sit there and you might have to pay to get it there and nobody's buying it. So yeah, the operator distributor relationship is super important in food service. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about distributors. And can you describe for us too, how distribution within food service is a little different than maybe retail distribution? I believe that UNFI does some food service distribution, but it's a little different. So can you tell us a little bit about that to set us up as well? Yeah, absolutely. In food service, especially in food versus beverage, there are tons of distributors. And I think in retail, it's a little bit more, it's just a little bit easier. There are a couple of big players in retail. And if you have your product stocked at Unify and Kehi, you can pretty much reach like any natural retailer like Sprouts or Whole Foods. Whereas in food service, there are so many different options and it actually can be a little competitive. So that's one of the things that is hard for manufacturers to understand in food service is, hey, where is our product going? It is can be extremely difficult to get data from food service on an operator level. But yeah, so because I was just at the DOT show, I will start with DOT. I really like DOT as a partner. They're very focused on supporting young companies, plant-based brands, better for you products. And they really are known for being leaders in that space. And like I mentioned before, they are a redistributor. So Dot will sell to pretty much anybody. They work with the big national accounts or national distributors like Cisco and US Foods and PFG and Gordon Food Service. But they also work with the smaller distributors like Byright and Chef's Warehouse and Vegan Distribution here in Hayward, California. And one of the things that they do, they help manufacturers like simulate because they stock all of our products. So when a new distributor wants to order our products and they're not located near one of our warehouses, right? Like they can't pick up for us, from us. It doesn't make sense for us to deliver to them. They maybe can't meet our minimums. We say, hey, we're stocked at DOT. And that really helps. So that has allowed us to get into a lot of other regional distributors like Vegan Distribution and like Cisco Memphis, for example. It also helps drive those those item code creations. So whenever you get into like a Cisco or a US Foods, you have to go through this process of getting an SUPC, which is a Cisco item number or a US Foods item number. And this allows you to be ordered from any of the other Cisco's or US Foods all around the country. So I think if you can, as a young brand, get into DOT, it does take some time. You have to build those distributor partnerships and show that there's a demand for your products, but they are super, super helpful. And then on the flip side, they help distributors because they can order a a lot of different products from Todd. Like they don't have to just order one whole truckload of uh, simulate nuggets. We would like that, but they can also attach or sit together with other things that they need. So they could ha have a half a truckload of frozen plant-based chicken nuggets and anything else frozen that they need. As long as it's the same temperature, they can order it all on one, one delivery. And then Dot typically delivers once or even twice a week to distributors that are moving a lot of volume. So they'll deliver on like Tuesdays and Thursdays, for example. So it really helps the whole supply chain process of food service, I think by having DOT as that like big redistributor. Other distributors will do some redistribution too. Like you brought up Unify. Unify will also do some redistribution. There are some other smaller redistributors, like there's one in the Pacific Northwest called Alpine, but DOT's really the one that I've worked with for the longest I'm most familiar with. I think I've been to their trade show like seven or eight times in St. Louis, yeah. Missouri. Oh, yeah. wow. That's awesome. And for DOT in particular, so 
To get set up, is it like an application process? Is it going to a show? Do you have to be working with them to go to a show? Can you tell us a little bit about that piece of getting in there and getting set up? Totally. So the person that I work with at DOT the most is Rod Willis. He's been there for a long time and he is the director of national and specialty. So he has done a lot of the pioneering for the plant-based brands. So he's a great advocate. However, you do have to show that you have business and you have some distribution before you can approach DOT because they're not going to work with every small brand that doesn't have some sales that can go through DOT. They're all about moving cases. They're not going to move any cases if they're not selling to anybody. And it's to attend their trade show, you do have to be a DOT supplier. You have to be stocked at DOT. So it takes a little bit of time to get to that point, maybe like even a year or so. But once you get to that point, then you're in. And the good news with DOT is that they also service retail. So DOT supplies big retailers like Walmart and Target. So if you happen to be a plant-based brand that started in retail and you have a foothold in retail, you can translate that to food service too, because Mm -hmm. you're already working with DOT to support your retail business. That does help. Interesting. And when you talk about being able to show that you have demand when you're on the smaller side, is that having information about reorders from individual colleges and universities that you're working with? Or what kind of data are you approaching? Because you mentioned the data is tough in this channel. So I'm curious, if you were helping someone approach DOT, what kind of data would you ask them to prepare? Or would you ask if they had access to before submitting? The good news is when you're smaller, and especially if you're going direct, you have a lot more access to data. For example, if you're, let's just say you're not in distribution yet at all, and you're sending all of your first initial orders directly to the operators, that's pretty common. And the operators, for the most part, will be open to that too, if they're also on the smaller side. If they're a lot larger, if they're a national account, they're going to have distribution, they're going to have their system, and you're going to have to work within their system. But If you're a small brand and you're just working with like mom and pop restaurants, let's just say here in the Bay Area, and you're trying to get your product into all the Bay Area, like best chef driven um, restaurants, you're trying to get into all the like Michelin star restaurants or all the vegan restaurants, just as an example, you could maybe supply them directly to start. And then if you're supplying them directly, you're getting the purchase order from the operator, you know what their movement is, what their use is. So you can then take that to distributors. So if I were starting a brand from the ground up, like here in the Bay Area, I would probably make a list of all of the restaurants or coffee shops or college universities that I wanted to get into as my like target list. And then once I have enough business flowing through there directly, I am ready to approach distributors. So then I would take that list of operators, go to a distributor like buy right here in the Bay Area and see if they'll stock my product and say, hey, I have X, Y, and Z restaurant. I know they already work with buy right. We're bringing you new customers. Let's take it from there. And then once you build that distributor strategy, you can take that to DOT too and do the same thing with them. Approach them, say, hey, we're working with US Foods and Cisco and Byright and Chef's Warehouse, and we'd love to come up with a solution to better service all these distributors. Yeah. Okay. Very, very interesting. And for working with a redistributor, is that something also that you have to do some planning on the margins? Because already with working with a distributor, you've got to plan the margins for the distributor. You've got to plan the margins for the retailer or the operator, you have a redistributor. Is that something that you plan ahead for or that you think of reaching a first a certain stage before working with the redistributor to make sure that the dollars make sense? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think every brand I've ever worked for has gone through some like growing pains there. Because in food service, you absolutely have to protect your margin. And if you start out with a really low price, which obviously is great, especially in food service, if you start out with a really low price that doesn't factor in those distributor programs, whether that's DOT or Cisco, you're going to have to take a price increase. And then your initial brands who are your loyal early adopters be like, why are you increasing my price as you grow? Like it it definitely causes a lot of, it can cause a lot of frustration. So going into it, I would make sure you protect your margins. DOT is going to have a, it's like per pound, they'll have a per pound program. And then the distributors will all have their own programs too. And let's just say, let's just say like a three to 5% marketing program to work with a distributor, attend their trade shows, get the product open coded, really get their team to sell it and be excited about it. So you do have to plan for all those buckets. And then you'll also have national account programs or operator programs programs as you grow. And you can leverage these to also get data. So if you're working with a larger operator and you give them a price discount to be on the menu or get like a menu mention, often they'll provide reporting on the back end. So you can really use those, those like that margin to your advantage if you plan ahead. Okay. And for, I'm wondering if there's any differences thinking through front of house, back of house, so using simulated as an example, if you're supplying bulk big bags of chicken nuggets to the cafeteria, but then you're providing a 
ready to heat pack like a retail pack for the student store. Is there any differences in getting those different items set up with someone like Dot or is it all the same? And is the the marketing materials that you provide differently curious about how that breaks down within distribution? For the most part, just using a college university as an example, because CNU, by the way, is like one of my favorite segments in food service. It's just so fun. And you can build college ambassadors and brand advocates. And there's just so much to do there. But pretty much every college university will have back of house and front of house. There are so many different places you can eat on campus, whether that's like sitting down and ordering a chicken sandwich or chicken nuggets or buying something in the market to take back to your dorm room and heat up. And they're usually serviced by different distributors. So Mm. it can be a little confusing. Just like using UC Berkeley as an example, they were one of my very first food service customers. I sold them just mayo back in 2014. So they were buying big gallons of plant-based mayo. And then they were also buying it for their stores. And a lot of college universities will have five dining halls, 10 dining halls, six different markets, places that you can go and buy groceries and stuff like that. So there's really a lot of business at every CNU. But yeah, so they'll use like a UNFI or a Vistar to service those little markets, the grab and go retail items. And then they'll probably use like a Byrite or a Cisco for the back of house products. So it can be a little confusing. The good news is that DOT sells to pretty much everybody. If you are able to get into DOT, you can then supply Vistar, Cisco, US Foods, Byrite with retail and food service items. Interesting. Yeah, that that makes sense. And for college and universities, like you mentioned, it's probably sometimes different buyers that you're working with. If sometimes cafeterias are part of a a buying group, like a management company, and then the student store might be owned by someone else. So that's super interesting to think through that you might, if you use someone like Dot, they can service everybody. But if you're using, you might have smaller distributors that you're working with to service the different pieces. And with working with Dot, what does it look like to set up the relationships with the accounts? Are you mostly meeting people at trade shows? Are orders being placed through finding in the catalog and then you're reaching out? What does it look like for you to ultimately connect with the operators that are purchasing from Dot? Then it's getting often going to a distributor and then it's ending up at an operator. How do you maintain the relationship being a couple degrees away? Honestly, it can be really challenging in food service. It is at the end of the day, all about relationships. And I tried to, I try to build relationships with every point of contact. So as a manufacturer who works with Dot, we have our own rep. So we have someone at Dot who manages our account. So that really helps. And you can work with your Dot rep to approach them with new products, to ask about the trade show, to put together marketing campaigns on their portal and all kinds of things. So I really lean on our Dot rep for a lot of different items. And even though he's not usually the person who manages what I'm asking for, he will connect me with anybody at Dot and pull those pieces together. And then it's also really important to maintain the relationship with the distributor. It's one thing to just have your product there. And let's just say they bring it in to fulfill an operator request. And it's just like a case that's moving through the system. That's one thing. But you can also lean on your distributor reps to help you get into other operators. And when you build those relationships with your distributor rep, and they know they can rely on you, they know they can call you be like, Jenna, I have a problem. I need a case. We're out or something. They can also bring you to meetings, bring you to cuttings, bring you to ride alongs and introduce you to their favorite customers. So I think it's really important to also build those relationships with the distributor reps and then obviously the operators. So whenever I'm talking to a college university or a restaurant chain, I try to find that brand advocate and that person who really loves the product and obviously likes me or the sales rep as a person. So I think it is really important to build relationships throughout every area of food service in order to be successful. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Can you describe for us when you use the term cutting, what does that refer to? Yeah, for sure. I feel like in food service, it's a little bit different than retail. A cutting can look like a bunch of different things, but it's essentially a presentation of your product. If you're working with a larger national account, it's going to be a little bit more official. Ideally, you'll have the CEO, the CMO, the culinary team It's going to be in more of a corporate, like a boardroom setting. You'll go and prepare the product in a kitchen that is also on site and then bring it in for the team to try. Or if it's a smaller customer, like a college university or a mom and pop restaurant, you're just going to go back in their kitchen and you're cooking your product using their equipment, whether that's like a deep fryer or a turbo chef. And you might even take your laptop and put it on the counter and do your presentation like in the kitchen with the, the chefs or maybe two or three people. But yeah, that's the cutting. It's just a presentation and tasting and eating your product. And is that typically set up when you are pitching the product or does that sometimes happen after maybe they've purchased from a redistributor like Dot and they're trying to teach their team about the product? When does that usually happen? 
I would say a cutting happens before they purchase it. Okay. So I would go and do a cutting to put my best foot forward and get them to buy my product. If you're doing a training, then that could look a little, a little bit different. Let's just say it's a regional chain and they've rolled out the product in all their locations. Then you may want to go and do a training for the employees and make sure that they're preparing it the right way that they're not like cooking it weird or mixing in an ingredient that breaks the formula or something like that. So that would be different, like a, a training. You need to pay for tomorrow's growth, but today's cash flow just doesn't quite cover it. So what do you do when you need inventory funding now? Welcome to Kick Further. Kick Further funds up to 100% of the cost of inventory up front, and you don't have to pay them back until that inventory begins to sell. Kick Further funding is not a loan, doesn't appear as debt on your books, and does not require equity. It's just capital right at the moment you need it to pay your most expensive cost, your inventory. Kick Further has already supported over 1,000 opportunities, including working for brands that you may know like Dr. Squatch and Good Wipes. To see how much inventory funding you qualify for today, go to kickfurther.com slash startup CPG. That's kickfurther. K-I-C-K-F-U-R-T-H-E-R dot com slash startup CPG, kickfurther.com slash startup CPG to learn more. Are you a founder or critical operator spending too much time on bookkeeping, expense classification, and tweaking your financial model when you should be spending your time on customers and growth? Q Graphite. They are a full finance department as a service for early stage and growing CPG startups. Think of having a CFO, controller, and bookkeeper, but for the fraction of the cost of hiring even one internal team member. That's Graphite. The truth is that most CPG founders fail due to a lack of understanding of their unit economics, aka a lack of proper accounting and finance. To download their free financial model template, free chart of accounts template, and other resources, go to graphitefinancial.com CPG. Graphite is also offering a special discount just for our listeners of 8% off their accounting and forecasting services. Head to graphitefinancial.com slash CPG to claim your discount. That's graphite, G-R-A-P-H-I-T-E, financial.com slash CPG. I feel like we could spend the whole time just talking about, just talking about Dot. Do you want to walk us through a couple other of the big distributors as well? Yeah. And I will start, I'll start with a small one first, just because it's on the top of my mind. But one of my first customers at Just, again, with the Just Mayo, this was back in 2015 or something like that. Her name is Sharon and she runs vegan distribution here in the Bay Area. And I've worked with her on several different brands, pretty much every brand that I've worked with. I've worked with Sharon in some capacity. So just keep that in mind, especially in food service. Even if people go to different roles or different companies, most people who are in food service stay in food service. And it's a very like close knit community. So if you're able to build those relationships, you can take them with you wherever you go and they'll take you wherever they go. That being said, vegan distribution is a, they're not tiny, but they're just a Bay Area distributor. And like the name says, they have only vegan products and they have a ton of customers here um, that they work with. And they work with a lot of the um, strictly vegan places, but then also a lot of places who just have plant-based menu offerings. And then going out from there, one of my other favorite distributors that's on the smaller side is Byright. They're also in the Bay Area, even though they're here, they're in Just Service the Bay Area. They're the 24th largest distributor in the country. And people know and love them. They have a great reputation for bringing in specialty items like artisan cheeses and stuff like that. And also plant-based products. I think they were one of the first distributors to bring in the Impossible Burger and really help that grow. Another one that is great to approach if you... They're small, but they also have like a nationwide presence and they specialize in those great metropolitan markets that a lot of plant based consumers live in and trendy up and coming, et cetera. Chef's Warehouse. So Chef's Warehouse, I would say they have a really good presence in California and New York, which for us at Simulate, that's a really good market. So Chef's Warehouse, great one. Again, all these people work with Dot. 
And then going up from there, I also really like Vistar. So Vistar and PFG are all one in the same. PFG is more of a traditional back of house food service. They're going to be carrying those bulk brands. But Vistar, they do tons of grab and go. So as you're approaching, for example, a college university, you can work with PFG on the food service side and then Vistar on the grab and go side. They also service this amazing operator called Follett Bookstores. And I think they have about 1200 locations, but Follett, wow. all of their locations are camp- campus adjacent. So it's you'd go there and get like swag for your CNU, whatever else, like pens or something. And then you could also buy food and drinks. They have coolers, they have freezers. So that one's really fun. And they use Vistar. And then there's obviously Cisco and US Foods. Everybody uses Cisco and US Foods. They will tell you, your operator will tell you. They'll they'll pretty much ask, pretty much everybody will ask right away if you are stocked at Cisco or US Foods. Those are obviously the big players. It can be hard to gain momentum nationwide, but you can start by building those regional partnerships. And a lot of CNUs use them too. If I were starting my own company, I would probably approach college university on the operator front and then build distribution that way. It's just an amazing place to start for plant-based and for so many reasons. College students are great advocates and brand loyalists and stuff like that. And then Cisco and US Foods also have really interesting programs that you can become a part of. The Cisco one is called Cisco Cutting Edge. I think Beyond Meat did this back in the day, but you basically make a custom flavor, custom product for Cisco, or you just have your product exclusive to Cisco for a year. But Cisco Cutting Edge Solutions is a good opportunity to get your product force stocked into every single Cisco Opco. But then keep in mind, you have to sell it too. So it's good when you're at a point a larger scale. You probably wouldn't want to do that like right away. But yeah, Cisco Cutting Edge Solutions is a good opportunity. I'm trying to think. And then there are tons of other Gordon Food Service based in Michigan. They're awesome. They have tons of plant-based products and tons of better for you natural products. And they also have really cool programs that you can participate in. They have have these storefronts too. So a lot of traditional food service distributors are now offering these markets and more grab and go focus areas. I think it's called like the GFS store or something like that. Shamrock also has, has a similar program. So you can target both like back of house, big boxes, traditional food service, and the more or grab and go like college university cafe etc yeah oh that's all super interesting and with the gordon foods that was one of my entry points to learning a little bit about food service was using their like direct program where they would place like small orders and they would just let us ship directly to the operator and that was really awesome as a small brand is that common in other distributors is that a good way to get into working with someone like gordon foods i'm curious about your thoughts on that kind of like direct piece yeah i I think the direct component is awesome. I think it provides a really good solution. And it can also, like you said, it can help small brands get their footing in food service. I think as a long-term strategy, it gets a little pricey. So as you're scaling, it it can be really hard if you're trying to approach national accounts or even like CNUs, and then your product ends up being so much more expensive than the meat-based or dairy-based product that they're using. And it can become a little unapproachable. But as a starting point, I say absolutely. There are a few others out there like Websterant and Food Service Direct that if you look on their website, site, they sell tons of plant-based stuff. And I'm speaking specifically about plant-based because that's the area I work in, but could also apply for just like better for you in general. But Food Service Direct, Webstaurant, they're pretty easy to start working with. And if you have your product stocked at DOT, they're probably going to order it regardless. And for US Foods and Cisco, you mentioned that getting set up with someone like Dot can help you get your item numbers within Cisco or US Foods. Also, have you taken the approach of approaching them directly first? What is that? How is that different? Do you have to have more volume than when you approach Dot? I'm curious why, what would be the pros and cons of approaching them directly versus getting set up with Dot first and then going to them? probably would want to approach them first, to be honest, as you're building your brand, working directly with the distributors, and then going to dot when you have some distributor pull. The kind of downside for working with them directly is depending on where your warehouse is, where you're producing your product, it's not going to be that cost efficient for you to deliver to them because you're probably going to have a minimum in place. And if you don't, you should. Whether that's like a palette or four palettes or something like that, the last thing you would want to do as a young brand is pay someone to put one palette of your products in a truck and then ship it across the country because mm-hmm. it's really expensive. However, if you have a warehouse that is near a Cisco, which like anyone probably would, Cisco's everywhere, you could work with them on FOB program and have them pick it up from you or deliver it very locally. So I think that would be a good strategy to optimize where your warehouses are. You can begin to um, build those direct relationships before you work with Dot. 
Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And then you mentioned some of the smaller, not small, but smaller, like the buy rights and the vegan distributor you mentioned for an emerging brand, like how does approaching those those distributors look? Can you approach with a little bit less data behind you? At what stage can you pitch those is a little bit earlier? How does that process different than from some of these bigger players? If I were working with Sharon at Vegan Distribution for the first time and I was trying to get my product stock with her, I would probably go to the vegan restaurants here in the Bay Area and get them interested in the product, go do some cuttings, get in the kitchen, figure out who would want to buy my product, and then take that list to Sharon and be like, hey, Sharon, I have 10 Bay Area vegan chefs who want to use my product. Can we talk? And assuming you have that demand and you have that pull, it would probably be pretty easy to get that product stocked. Okay. And is there anything that you prep on the marketing side before reaching out to these distributors as well, or that's unique to any of the distributors as far as setting them up for success to have information to put on the menu or to make sure that they're going to be ha- have what they need to feature the product? Yeah, I'm curious about the marketing side, if there's anything you think through when you're reaching out to a distributor. You mentioned setting aside some budget for the marketing programs, but I'm curious if there's any other tips there. Yeah, that's a really good question. I know you asked about that earlier with the seeing you kind of like front of house, back of house component. So I'll try to tackle both of those. But yeah, so you can definitely build a restaurant kit for operators. And I would highly encourage every brand to do this. At Simulate, I'm super lucky. We have amazing branding and everything we send our operator partners looks really nice. But this could be, it's a wide variety of things, right? Like it could be swag. So you can have swag for the employees and they can represent your brand while they're working. It's great visibility. When I started with just formerly Hampton Creek in 2014, we had all the Whole Foods Market employees wearing our shirt with the logo. And we would send shirts and hats and stuff like that to everybody. And they just permeated. I remember seeing them everywhere. I still see them sometimes, the original like egg logo. But yeah, so you can do swag, you can do static clings, you can do freezer clings for the market, like grab and go. You can do branded toothpicks, you can do stickers for sandwich wrappers. It just depends what your product is and you know how consumers are interacting with your product. You could even do a nugget box, for example, if you wanted to do something a little bit um, more expensive and and higher end. But keep in mind, the only thing I I would caution about this, if your operators get really used to having those and you're supplying them for free, it can get a little pricey just depending on the size. Let's just say you send 500 stickers or like 20 t-shirts and then they open another location. They have more employees coming in. They're doing training. So just like keep that in mind as you grow. Those materials can be pricey. Yeah. And what was the name of the book something that's near college campuses? It was that a distributor or a buying group? That is an operator. So oh, okay. Follett, operator. Yeah, Follett Bookstores. Like I said, I think they have 1,200 locations. And then uh, Vistar is their primary distributor, which is part of PFG now. Okay, wow. So with an operator like that, I don't know if there's other operators uh, that you have as examples, but I'm curious about developing a relationship like that. Did that is that something that came from the distribution side or is that something where you approach them and then you have the distribution to support it? Because that seems like a really... That's a really big operator to get a connection with. So what does it look like to establish that relationship? Honestly, that one materialized from building a relationship with everybody. So we already had some business flowing through Vistar for smaller opportunities. And then also we're working with Follett and able to provide like marketing and stuff like that. So it really is about building those relationships. Because if you're working with a large operator like Follett, for example, or any national account, They probably won't want to work with you if you have zero distribution. If they say, hey, I prefer Vistar, hey, I prefer Cisco, they're not just going to want to stock that product in all of their locations if nobody can order it. Because what's going to happen is it's going to be a special order. It's going to be out of stock. It's going to have a really long lead time. And all of those things are disadvantages to working with that particular brand because they can't get it. So it really is about that push and pull strategy and nurturing both relationships at the same time. Can you take the demand from say, okay, we're not set up yet, but if you say yes, can you take that demand to the distributor? I know that there's like anchor accounts in the retail space. I'm curious with the push pull, if you can get a certain ways along and then take it to the distributor and say, hey, they'll buy if you set us up in your system. Yeah, absolutely. I do that all the time. Part of it is also leaning on your account. By account, I mean operator. So if I was working with a a CNU for the first time, I went and did a cutting. They love the simulate chicken tender. They want to bring it in. Then I would ask the chef or ask the purchasing manager, hey, can you please put me in touch with your distributor rep? And so then you've got that direct connection 
and your operator is helping to advocate for you where they're like, hey, we want this. So I myself as the brand am not going to distribute and saying, hey, I think the operator wants it. They might want it. It's instead having that direct relationship and having that advocate be like, hey, we want to order this. Here's our usage. Can you please get it for me? And then of course it helps being stocked at dot because then anyone all over the country, any distributor can be like, oh, great, you're stocked at dot. Boom, it's on a truck. Are there shows also for just Cisco, US Foods, Gordon Foods? Are there specific shows or are there shows that you go to see all of them? Because like Dot has their own show. I'm curious about any other show strategy with the distributors. Yeah, definitely. The Dot show is awesome. I don't mean to keep talking about Dot, but I was just there. They had 1,000 or 1,500 attendees. It was 70% distributors and 30% national counts. So there were a ton of distributors there. And in addition to having Cisco and US Foods and stuff, there was also Shamrock, Sunbelt, Chef's Warehouse. They really do get a, a good following of distributors who attend. And then, yes, every distributor has their own trade show too. And that all factors into those marketing programs and making sure you have the budget for that. Byright has a really awesome trade show here in the Bay Area. Shamrock has a really good trade show in Southern California. Cisco and U.S. Foods all have their own shows. And it can be a little overwhelming to think about because there are so many distributors out there and everyone does have a show that you can participate in. But as long as you're building those relationships with like thought and care and not trying to go everywhere all at once, they're really fun. And you usually meet a lot of good customers. Yeah, that makes sense. On the operator national account side, I'm sure there's a lot, but are are there any other national account operators that you wanted to mention here or just shout out for anybody that it may be helpful to be familiar with? Yeah, definitely. And this kind of goes when I'm speaking about operators, essentially, operators are split up into two buckets. It's commercial and non commercial. So a commercial operator essentially means a restaurant chain. So that could be like McDonald's or Panda or a smaller local restaurant or regional restaurant chain that has 50 locations or something. And non commercial is everything else. So that could be a hospital, a college university, a prison, a theme park. So food service is massive and it it can be a little bit hard to understand. But I think just like thinking about it that way is helpful for me. But yeah, so for larger restaurant chains, a lot of my experience, honestly, is working with smaller regional restaurant chains. And they're really cool to build relationships with. They all have amazing, passionate teams and so much creativity on the culinary side and the menu. But just a few that I've worked with in the past, I really love. Pete's Coffee, they have a great team. They're based here in Oakland. They're really plant-based forward. Everyone's super, super smart who works there. They're just brilliant. Bear Burger, based in New York. They also have, I was there for the Vegan Women Summit a few weeks ago, and I had the Impossible Nuggets, which were on the menu. And I swear they tasted just like chicken nuggets. And Granted, I've been playing based for a very long time, but it was really cool to just like order that and dip it in the sauce and stuff. Bear Burger is great. I've also worked with Veggie Grill a lot in the past. They're awesome. Phil's Coffee with a Z here in the Bay Area. Again, just like really cool. Great food, great concept. Modern Market based in Denver. They're part of Lemonade now. Lemonade's also great based in Southern California. And then one of my favorite customers, Red Robin, they actually are working on a lot of new plant-based stuff. They're awesome. But one of my favorite customers of all time is probably Disney World and Disneyland. They're so cool. They have an amazing culinary team. It can be hard to get in there and to get your brand established. And there's definitely like a lot of branding that goes into that. But yeah, Disney has an amazing team. So interesting. And for those accounts, like with Disney, is buying centralized or are you reaching out to each Disney location or with Pete's Coffee? Are you reaching out to individual locations or at some point is it consolidated into buying decisions across the whole brand? Yeah. So when you get to that point and you're working with larger customers, the good news is they have like a preferred distributor and they have a method set up already. For example, if you're working with a Cisco, you're probably going to have to fill out an ONZA form, which is an opera negotiated supplier agreement. And that essentially will put in place pricing, any special pricing that you put together for them. Disney, they do a lot of centralized buying. They use a few different distributors. And obviously Disney World purchases from different ones than Disneyland because they're in different locations, but they will let you know who they're using and can help you get it stocked and stuff like that if they like your product. There are some smaller ones, smaller chains that will use maybe a couple different distributors, but as long as you have a good relationship with the operator, they can help you navigate those conversations and put you in touch with who you need to be put in touch with. There are also amazing like regional plant-based chefs and chains that are so fun to work with. Next Level Burger, the founder, Matt, is amazing. He's such a visionary and I think he just opened a couple locations like one in Denver. The Plant Power Fast Food team is great too. Down in San Diego, they're also like opening new locations and always changing their menu. Their food's delicious. There are a lot of them. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's super great. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about buying groups. Like you mentioned Compass. Can you share a little bit about 
maybe some of the buying group players, what it looks like to work with someone like Compass. And how do you know when a buying group is involved versus reaching out directly? I'm curious a little bit about that. Yes. So working with buying groups can be It's a lengthy process. It can definitely be time consuming and it can be hard to get in touch with the right people because the buying groups are massive. They have so many employees, different sectors, and getting that top level communication can be really hard. So I would encourage brands to find an advocate on a more regional basis and kind of build from there and then work your way into getting a national contract, which Again, going back to margin, it's going to cost money to have a national contract with any of these folks. I've worked a lot with Compass in the past. They're always going to be probably one of my favorite ones, but Compass is massive. Compass Food Buy has so many different sectors. It's such a dynamic business and food service, and they really service every area of food service. So Compass, they have a college, university, and a K-12 sector called Chartwell's. Chartwell's team is amazing. They're always like looking at the forefront. There's Bon Appetit that also has a lot of really cool restaurants, colleges, and universities. Universities. There is Levy, which does all of the stadiums. Stadiums are really fun, lots of volume, great products, like very culinary focused. And then there's URS that does like corporate cafeterias and stuff like that, like a LinkedIn or a Twitter, for example. So yeah, Compass Food Buy is great. They're huge. And it can take time to get your product in there. But really, there are so many areas that you can approach because they do the traditional like back of house food service, bigger boxes. And then they also have a lot of grab and go. So if you have a product and you're going into food service, chances are you have a product that they would want to order. It just can take time to get like the pricing and stocked and all that stuff. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I interacted a little bit with Compass for LinkedIn. It was right as the pandemic started. I think we shipped a PO for the LinkedIn headquarters and then it was like locked down and we didn't get a reorder because no one was at the office. (laughs) So that was my very brief interaction with Compass, but that's very interesting. And it sounds really intimidating making regional relationships first. How do you recommend people even approach that? Where do you start? I would suggest maybe starting in the college university space, just because it is such a captive audience. And there are tons of self-operated CNUs. So self-operated just means that they don't work with one of those buying groups, but it's pretty easy to figure out who they do work with. If you go to the Sodexo or the Chartwell's websites, they'll usually have an area where you can look up their schools. So you could always do it that way. And then when you're approaching them, LinkedIn's great. Like you can get so much information off of LinkedIn. If it were me, I'd probably go on the Chartwell's website, find one of their CNUs, ideally located somewhere where I could service it, where like a warehouse is or manufacturer is, and then try to find out who the chef or marketing people are on LinkedIn and go that way. If it's purely cold outreach, you can also get lucky too. Like you can be talking to or working with a CNU already. And they're like, oh, we're Compass Food Buy. And so then you will like stumble upon an advocate that way. Like for the corporate cafeterias and stuff, you could always like go in and then try to find out who they use or who they work with. Are there some other major buying group players that would be helpful for folks to know about? Yeah, definitely. Sodexo is great too. And Sodexo has a really cool trade show. I think it's in North Carolina. I've only been to it once, but they also do a really good job of bringing in plant-based, better for you, younger brands. They have a huge healthcare sector. So Sodexo is a great one to approach for that. And then they also have some amazing CNUs too. So yeah, Sodexo is great. Aramark, they're all huge. Aramark is massive and they also have tons of colleges and universities. Same with Sodexo. I would say maybe pick one area. For example, if you have a product and you're really targeting healthcare, then maybe go the Sodexo route. Or if you're doing CNU, you could do Aramark or Compass or Sodexo there too. But yeah, I would just advise brands to not get like super overwhelmed with all of the opportunity in food service in general and just see where you have a product market fit and then go that direction. Yeah, that's super interesting. And like Aramark, I'm more familiar with them on the like uniform side, like they, they do a ton. So totally. Yeah, that's so interesting to think about how they're within like food and everything. So yeah, that's wow. Is there anything else that you wanted to share about within navigating some of these big players or anyone that we missed in any of the areas that we've talked about? There was one bucket that I wrote down actually to another area in food service that I'm quite fond of is the C store space, the convenience space. If you're a younger brand and you're trying to break into that space, I would encourage you to get like a C-store specific broker because it's all about relationships and they can help navigate the distribution, the the operators, the the opportunity there. Um, But I really like the convenience space. And a lot of convenience stores are now ordering and using plant-based ingredients, whether that's like for their back of house, like deli, 
they're using a mayo or they're using like a plant-based chicken nugget. Um, it's becoming increasingly more popular. There's one here in the Bay Area called Lube Convenience. Um, they're like a better for you convenience store chain and they're attached to all the Shell gas stations and they bring in tons of really cool plant-based stuff. There is like 7-Eleven. I was just in Hawaii for the honeymoon and I was able to try the Omni Foods spam musubi at 7-Eleven. It was such a cool experience. It was totally plant-based. So that's another area that I would suggest to brands if they have a convenience forward product and um, they're trying to break into that sector. And then just in general, if you are starting from scratch, you may want to bring in an advisor or a broker to help you grow in food service because it can be a little bit overwhelming. And if you have zero relationships, you might want to work with someone who does have those relationships and can help you as a third party before you bring in an internal team. Yeah, no, I, those are all really great notes. And I'm glad you mentioned like convenience, especially with the focus on like better for you and plant based here in the Pacific Northwest, we have like plaid pantry, it's 100 plus locations, and they're trying to bring in really better for you brands. And they've supported a lot of local and even just smaller brands getting them to their stores and 100 locations is awesome. So yeah, that's really interesting on that piece. As far as getting help within food service, and we talked about this some in our other episode where we talked about first hires and but do you have any advice for as as you're growing within food service, like when you're super small, like how do you know what size broker to look out for? I know last time you gave us a few recommendations, which was awesome, but curious about just any tips for kind of finding the right person to meet you where your business is at right now versus reaching out to a broker that's going to be way too big for where you're at. Like how do you navigate the like stepping stones? If you're starting from scratch or you're really small, you could always work with a regional broker. There are tons of amazing regional brokers. Like there's one here in the Bay Area called Her Spring Gives I really like. And they have a lot of really good relationships. They're down in, I want to say it's near like Redwood City, but they're somewhere further south in the Bay. And then there's another one in LA called Acclaim Food Service. They're amazing. I would definitely recommend them if you're trying to grow in LA. There's one in Texas called Fiddler Marketing that I really enjoyed working with. So yeah, you could always go the regional approach. I would definitely encourage brands to start smaller and go from there because if you work with a large national broker and keep in mind, like, there's a lot of plant-based products now. So they may already have a competitive brand and they won't bring you in. So there's that too. They already have a plant-based chicken. They already have a plant-based meat or a beef. So that can be a little difficult. You're going to spend a lot of money training and even getting product samples to those bigger brokers. I'm talking like 20 offices or 30 offices and then going and training everybody. So it can be really expensive if you start big. So I would encourage to start small and then grow from there. There are also some really cool, more like advisors than traditional brokers that have a smaller team with a national presence and can help you navigate the areas of food service that you might not know how to navigate, like bids for K-12, through for example, or working with Sodexo or Compass Food Buy. The ones that I've worked with in the past would be Alohi. I really like the Alohi team, Green Nature Marketing. And there is also one that this has more of a grab and go focus that I cannot remember right now, but I will remember it and I will send it to you. <laughs> Perfect. These are all awesome. And I will include links and names of everything that you've shouted out in the show notes too, so that folks can go and grab those when they're in case they're driving or something right now, because those are all really awesome. This has been so helpful. Is there anything else you wanted to share before we wrap up? I think I covered all my notes. Oh, Grocerant. The Grocerant space is awesome. So if you are starting in retail specifically and you have relationships with Whole Foods or Sprouts and your product is stocked at UNFI and you're thinking of launching in food service, the Grocerant space, grocery store, restaurant, the deli, the prepared salads, the sandwiches, huge volume opportunity. If you can get in with your product and your ingredients are clean, like organic, non-GMO, for example, no preservatives, that's a really cool area to start in food service as well. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm so glad you added that note. That's hard to say. Grocerant. Grocerant. <laughs> that's a super interesting way to get your foot in the door. And yeah, I hadn't thought about how you're already on the shelves in the store and then getting into that space. So that's amazing. This has been packed with so many tips, Jenna. Thank you so much. I will share your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Are you okay if folks reach out to you? What's the best way to connect with you? LinkedIn is perfect. Sometimes I'm a little slow at responding to messages, but I always get back to everybody. So yeah, LinkedIn's great. This is awesome. It was so good to have you back on the show. I'm so glad that you shared with us today. Thank you so much. Just really appreciate you and excited for everyone to take what they've learned from the episode and grow within food service. Thanks so much for having me, Jesse. This is awesome. People can reach out with any questions. Happy to share any other links too that I think of after this. Thank you for listening in today. 
I'm so honored you joined me for this conversation and I love hearing from you all with feedback, suggestions, or if you just want to say hi at podcast at startupcpg.com or you can find me on LinkedIn. If you liked this episode, we'd love for you to share it with a friend or colleague, subscribe so you don't miss future episodes, and maybe even leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you aren't yet in our Slack community of founders and experts, we'd love to see you there. You can get the free invite at startupcpg.com and find all our other awesome resources there like webinars, databases, the blog, the magazine, and virtual and in-person events. And if you found yourself rocking out to our intro and outro music, which I do every single time, make sure to check out the Super Fantastics on Spotify. It's the band of our Startup CPG founder, Daniel Scharf. I'm Jesse Freitag, your host and producer. And on behalf of the whole team at Startup CPG, thank you for being here and see you next week.